This talk is a summary talk that gives an overview to the four weeks of lectures that cover the nutritional relationships to degenerative diseases. The degenerative diseases are defined as those diseases that are unnatural to man, that never happens to primates in the wild, and that rarely happen to those in the undeveloped nations that don't have the benefits of the high-fat, high-cholesterol diet that we have in the developed nations. These degenerative diseases are called heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, cancer in many forms, gallstones, or high blood pressure, glaucoma, cataract, loss of hearing. These are all the degenerative diseases, diseases that are unknown to primates and to man in his natural state. Now, many people have looked for causes for these diseases. They look for viruses, look for toxins, pesticides, stress, heredity. However, we're going to find, and we're finding every day in scientific experiments, that the causes of these degenerative diseases and these incidents are the principal cause of death in the developed nations, that the cause of these diseases are from the ordinary foods that we eat. They're the ordinary foods that we're taught to love by our parents, and they're the foods that I consider indispensable to a good nutritional diet by the nutritionists that advise people in our country and countries like ours. Ordinary foods in excess can become poisonous to the body. Water, iron, these are all substances we consider absolutely indispensable. Iron is part of the red blood cell. Without the red blood cell, you would be dead. And yet the iron comprises 5% of the total weight of a red blood cell. Yet in Africa, in Bantu country, 10 million Bantus, use iron pots to cook their food. And the iron rusts a little bit. And the little bit of rust then gets into their food. And in a period of time, the iron overloads the liver. And the principal cause of death then is iron overloading of the liver. The iron just fills the liver to such an extent it's just like an alcoholic who has cirrhosis of the liver and dies from that cause. Iron overloading the liver. So too much iron and too much of other things can create poisonings to the body. The principal toxic factors in the developed nation's diet that creates their degenerative diseases are simply the fats, the cholesterol, and in a lesser way, the refined foods. We have an additional insult in developed nations, and that is the smoking habit. So you have to ask then, what diet should one be on? And how do you determine the best diet for man? What is the natural diet for man? What's the diet he should be on? If you want to ask what the natural diet for chimpanzees might be, it's very simple. You go into the wilds of Africa, you find chimpanzees that have never been disturbed by man, and observe what they eat, and you'll know what the natural diet is. But you can't find a group of men that have not been affected by civilization. There is no natural diet for man any more that you can find, so you'll have to guess what it could have been. And our guess is that the natural diet of man had to be a diet where refined foods are not included. And by refined foods, we mean, and these are the, many of the artificial foods that are not found in nature, the foods that are derived and manufactured. For example, one manufactured food is margarine. Margarine is considered rather an important food in the food supply, yet margarine is a manufactured food made by chemical processes out of various fats and oils. It's called a hydrogenated fat made by chemical methods. Now, butter itself is a manufactured food. Without man taking the milk of a, an animal, separating the fat out, processing the fat in a certain way to create the butter, you couldn't have it. Oils, vegetable oils, are considered natural foods, but they're not. Without man taking the nut and seed, the corn and so on, from which oil is made and processed them by very special ways, you couldn't have oil. For example, it takes 14 ears of corn to make one tablespoon of corn oil. Cheeses are man's invention. The dairy products, it's unnatural, for example. There isn't a group in the world that has its milk after its wean. Man is an exception. He gets it from other animals and uses their milk as part of a drink. And we have unnatural animals. 
These are the feedlot animals. These are the animals raised under artificial conditions. There are chickens that are raised that never see the ground. They're in cages all through their lifetime. Animals are fed with hormones to make them grow faster, make them grow heavier. Beef animals have intense marbling in their muscles, between the muscle fibers. In fact, a feedlot animal can have 50% of its total carcass in fat, whereas a range-fed animal only has 9%. So you already have 500% more fat in an artificially grown animal than a natural animal. When you look at food, people have mistaken ideas because of the pressures of the wrong kind of information, the so-called nutritionists that run our society and determine our food intake. Potatoes are considered fat, yet potatoes have 1% of their total calories in fat. Bananas are considered fattening, yet they only contain 2% of their total calories in fat. Cheese is considered a high-protein food, yet it contains 70% of its total calories in fat. Nuts are considered a high-protein food, yet they're 75% of the total calories in fat. A good fillet is considered a choice piece of protein. You get an excellent fillet, it could be 85% total calories in fat. So we have mistaken ideas about what foods are composed of. And if you eat foods that are refined like sugar or fat, neither of which have anything but calories, neither of which have vitamins, minerals, dietary fiber, they're just straight calories. That's the way to gain weight because sugar and fat could be eaten in great quantities without really being, uh, uh, feeling that you have satisfied your hunger. And it's only in countries that eat refined foods where there's such a thing as overweight. What happens when you violate nature's laws and eat the refined foods? We have that in Dr. Swank's works, Dr. Quo's works, Dr. Friedman's works. Dr. Swank, for example, in his first work on determining what happens in the body when you have cream, high fat in the, in the uh, meal, took little hamsters. And the reason he selected them is because they have large cheek pouches. He pulled open their cheek pouch, clamped it tight, and with a microscope looked at the fine blood vessels that he could see through the transparent skin or membrane of the inside of the mouth. And all the vessels were free-flowing. All the little blood vessels, you can see the little cells going through. Yet when he gave them a glass of heavy cream, within an hour and a half to two hours, the little cells started to stick together and form great clumps blocking the vessels. In five or six hours, probably 25% of all the vessels were blocked in these little hamsters. At the same time, he measured the amount of oxygen in their blood and in their tissues. One third less oxygen is what he measured. He decided not to give them anything more to eat for 72 hours to see when the oxygen level would restore the normal. And it took 72 hours, and they still were 5% less oxygen when they started. Well, they couldn't keep them without food any longer. But in the American diet, where one fat meal follows another every six hours, everybody has blocked vessels all the time. When Dr. Quo, Peter Quo, a cardiologist in Philadelphia at the time, decided to see if Swank's experiments work on his angina patients, he invited 14 angina patients to his office, took some blood samples, the blood was reasonably clear, taped them to electrocardiographic equipment, no coronary insufficiency, and then gave them a glass of heavy cream. And it only took four to five hours when the fat and the cream poured into the bloodstream to block enough vessels so that he registered 14 cases of angina. The electrocardiogram confirmed the angina. The blood samples had five times as much fat as when he started. And when Dr. Williams did his work, he was able to confirm that the small vessels of the eyes that were completely open before the cream drink, after the cream drink, many vessels were closed, just like in the hamster study. And when Dr. Crow did this test again, a short time later with the same angina patients, he gave them another drink. This time, there was no fat in the drink, just protein and carbohydrates, but the same amount of calories and the same amount of bulk. And this time, five hours after the test, the blood had no additional fat in it, the electrocardiograms were all completely normal, and there wasn't a single angina attack. When Dr. Meyer Friedman of the Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco, he wrote the book on type A and type B personalities. He believes in the stress theory to some extent, but he was concerned about the American Heart Association recommendations that it's all right to eat your natural diet as you eat in this country, but just